Hello and welcome to Hosting HR with me, Leon Morley, founder of HR Recruitment Solutions. In this show, we're going to be discussing how HR can drive company performance. Uh, we're actually live at the moment across uh, LinkedIn, uh, across YouTube, and also on Facebook as well. It'd be great to get your thoughts through the show and certainly any questions that you might have for the panel. We love to hear those too. And I'll do my best to make sure that those questions get put to the panel. So let's start then with some introductions, shall we? So, um, Hein, would you like to introduce yourself to the audience? <laughs> Leon, <clears throat> so I'm a lifetime HR guy, and lifetime means all my professional life, which is, <laughs> spans now 36 years. And of those, I've been uh, 35 years in corporate life, of which the last 15, 16 years as a chief HR officer. And I joined a boutique a consultancy founded by the guy I worked for at Unilever at the time, the then chief HR officer, Sandy Ock. We're working on, on, on high-end talent solutions with CEOs that drive uh, value creation. We may get into that later. And so over the course of my career, I've been thinking, particularly the last 10 years, about what makes sense in HR and what doesn't. Would that be enough as an introduction? That's perfect. Yeah, that's, that's exactly what we're looking for. Um, I'll come to you next, Volker. Okay. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, Volker Jacobs. I'm. Yeah. I spent most of my my career in an HR consulting role. So did HR transformation consulting work in very large organizations across Europe. Um, sold my consulting business to CEB now Gartner. Um, and at CEB Gartner, I, I led some research initiatives around digital HR and. From that, five years ago, I founded uh, my company, TI People. We are um, a niche company that is um, dealing with the, the topic of employee experience, and, and we help large organizations, HR functions, also business leaders provide better employee experience to their people. And, uh, and we found a way to make that to do that in a very data driven way so we can with data help organizations focus on the very few of the many experiences that matter and that's uh, uh that's that's our business so volker you and i have worked ever since you started ti people exactly you, you are you're nice. almost the sponsor of the whole thing <laughs> <laughs> well that's good it's good to know we're amongst friends <laughs> Um, so um, finally, Kevin, please introduce yourself uh, to our yeah. audience. Good evening, everybody. Um, uh, my current role, I've only just uh, gone back in to do a chief people officer role. Uh, I did it interim for three or four months and I've only been in place, oh, I don't know, I think I started at the beginning of September, so two and a bit months. So um, the organisation's first group, FTSE 200 uh, business, um, particularly focusing on the bus division in the UK, which is 14,000 people, 700 million turnover, second biggest bus company. <laughs> um, but what's interesting about the current role is we've just divested of all of our American assets, where the yellow buses that take kids to school and Greyhound. So we are now on a sort of a trajectory where we've paid down that, paid off the pension deficit, and we are now trying to reinvent ourselves. Um, and that involves spending a million pounds, not a million, a billion pounds in the next 10 years on decarbonisation, the buses and electrifying and hydrogen and all of that. So I'm really quite excited about what the business is doing. People stuff, it's a legacy business, big transformation required. HR, very transactional, very support service. And all of the value now comes from becoming a service brand and, and, and working very differently. So that's the current gig. Historically, um, did a big transformation turnaround at uh, Royal Mail pre-privatization, five years there ahead of HR. And then I spent 10 years running the professional body for the recruitment industry in the UK and sitting on the global board as well. So spent a lot of time working both um, with corporate clients, but also with uh, recruitment and talent organizations. So spent most of my life a bit like Henning in 30, most probably 37, 38 years in sort of the people side of business. Um, so that's me. And I suppose I've written a best-selling business book um, called Competitive People Strategy, which was uh, 
something I really enjoyed doing and I'm meant to be right the second one at the moment, but finding that a little difficult with the full-time job. <laughs> Kevin, <clears throat> Kevin I, I suppose the Royal Mail job, that was the, the job that made you a man. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I did. it's interesting, you know, having done that for five years, so that involved um, a business that was losing a million and a half pounds a day, was just about to be given away to the Dutch post office for a pound, and we had to turn around a great British institution. You know, I'm very proud of what we did there, but it did involve losing 35,000 people, closing factories, modernising process, using technology differently, setting up a data business, running a parcels division. It was a job that I always said I'd never go back and do a transformation for real, and then here I am a few years <laughs> later doing exactly the same. A smaller business, but a lot of the same issues. <laughs> And just Very just good. on the, the book, um, because um, you uh, obviously, well, Kevin, um, we spent a little bit of time talking about that on the HR Book Club. And um, that is now, just so everybody's aware, is now uh, on the YouTube channel for hosting HR. So um, there's the book right there. So Competitive People Strategy by Kevin Green. Uh, so go to the YouTube page and you can certainly check that one out. And um, hopefully, I'm sure once you've watched that interview, you'll want to purchase the book as well <laughs> and supercharge your HR um, career even Thank further. Liam, I appreciate that. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, so um, the next thing we normally do at this stage is, um, and this will actually be the final one. So um, I, I know some people are very, very happy about this and some people uh, will be absolutely gutted about it. Certainly it's been quite a popular um, feature and a lot of people said they've had a lot of laughs from it. So, but we always play um, two lies, one truth. And this is really where we each tell uh, each um, three facts about ourselves um, and then at the end of the show we'll reveal which one is the the truth and um, yeah so um, let's go in the same order because it makes sense to do that so Hein um, please tell us um, the, your three facts about yourself yeah so unsurprisingly it's not the lies that were difficult it's the truth that's difficult <laughs> so, <laughs> three statements about <laughs> Uh, in my younger years, I was a certified choir master conducting a immense choir in church. And here's the interesting story that goes with it, where my dad did that and my granddad, that, whom I never knew, uh, did that. And his father did that. And I was conducting the choir during the rehearsal. And then I was given the instruction to an older man in this with the second basses. And then he looked at me and he said, young man, I've been singing here ever since your granddad was a choir master. And I've always sing this note in this way and i'm not going to change it and i found that a humbling lesson for a choir is master. that is that your truth then hein have you just revealed it straight away this is, this or is, is that an elaborate lie you potentially find out, you find out, you find <laughs> oh okay out, you could be an elaborate lie okay so i thought <laughs> i have to create stories is that right oh i and see and this i still read one book a week it is uh, most often non-fiction Next week, I'll read Gavin's book because it's uh, it's intriguing. <laughs> <laughs> and the third fact is I am a runner. I'm an amateur runner. But still, I run three times a week, and that gets me to 45 kilometers a week. So oh, those right. are the um, – and that's in the park, which is which is in front of my uh, house. So that's all very easy. But it's still 45 kilometers a week. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. I think I know which one which one's the truth, man. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> I, yeah, well, you two know each other, so you've got a little no, bit. No, of... no, 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 <laughs> oh, just just from that. Okay, go no, on then, Volker. What are yours? You. <laughs> what are yours, Volker? Uh, okay, so the, the first first one is um, I am, as we speak, I'm the acting. I'm, I live in Hamburg in Germany, so I'm, I'm I'm the acting Hamburg champion in traditional archery. Um, okay. The second right. is, um, is is a very private fact. I drew my wife in a lottery. <laughs> right. And, <laughs> and the third is um, yeah. a couple of years ago, actually it's more than a couple of years, it's like 14 years ago, I hit the 50 meters mark in free diving. Oh, Interesting. Interesting. 
I, I, so, look, yeah. I hope it's that last one, actually, to be honest with you. That must be the truth. <laughs> <laughs> I'm skeptical. So I don't know. Go on then, Kevin. What are your three facts? Uh, I've got, uh, yeah, three interesting ones. I, I'm not quite sure what's the truth and what's the lie, but we'll get to that at the end. Though. Um, yeah, uh, I'm I'm married with seven children. Um, quite a distinction, yeah. really, to have that many children in in this day and age. Um, second one earlier, um, I, I sort of do amateur dramatics, and I played the lead role in The King and I. Um, if any of you know that musical, Hammersmith, Rogers and Hammerstein, isn't it? And I had to be painted yellow every night. And then my third fact is, and what I'm sort of quite proud of, I beat uh, Chris Akabusi, who was a um, uh, world champion, 4x400 metres and um, um, European champion at 400 metre hurdles. I beat him uh, oh, about 25 years ago, over 800 metres in a track race. So... <clears throat> Sweet. Those are my three facts. I'll be delighted to tell you what the truth yeah. is. If I can I'm work about it to say, I'm yeah. very skeptical on that last <laughs> one again. <laughs> In my experience, this is something I've picked up over the last eight or nine shows. The last one is very rarely true because people very rarely put the true one last. So that's, that's <laughs> one, something, something I've worked out. There was one, I think, um, in the last show we had Perrine Fark on uh, for the diversity inclusion, and I'm pretty sure her last one was actually true. But normally, the last one is normally a lie. That's that's what I've picked up over the over the shows. Right, should we get into something uh, a bit more obviously on onto the topic? So the first thing I wanted to bring to your attention really was. Um, I did a, a poll um, last week on LinkedIn. Um, I'll just bring it up on here. So it was um, most HR efforts fail. Um, so and really, I was very intrigued about how the HR community really felt about, you know, how much success they were really having. Um, and it kind of linked a little bit to this because um, I always feel that if you can show the commercial benefit of, of, of what you're doing, then actually why should anything fail that we're doing? So, uh, but anyway, I'll bring up the results again. So you can see there we had 37% said true, 63% uh, said false. Now, obviously, it's very hard to say true because it's almost a little bit critical of yourself and your peers and, and you know, the profession that you're in as well. So um, I'm just wondering in terms of what your thoughts are about that. Are you surprised um, that there is 37% that, that feel that or what's your What's your take on it? Does anyone would like to come in and, and give us your thoughts? I, I would say <clears throat> I'm so uh, it's laudable that 63% would state that most efforts do not fail because if you don't believe in the efforts you start and yeah. why you started at all, mm -hmm. I in in hindsight and this Leon, I'm only going to say to you after 36 years of uh, collecting mm -hmm. the scars on my back of the stupid mistakes I made. <laughs> I think very many HR efforts uh, don't fail because we make up the story, but do fail because we have not been able to to establish a line of sight with company performance. And mm -hmm. at the end of the day, given decency, given dignity, and give, giving uh, regulations you have to obey, everything that all that counts is does an initiative make this company a better company? And, and from that perspective, I have to very humbly say that very often my own initiatives failed, even if I was always able to make a great story of it. So, so that's, the, that's my double answer, my double first thoughts on the statement. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I, my take, I suppose, would be um, I think most HR initiatives, programs, activity, they sort of never quite succeed and they never quite fail i think we end up with you know we end up partly succeeding and that's one of the great difficulties with with mm -hmm. hr activity is there is no definitive success or failure because the the line of sight to company performance as henning said is you know you can draw the line i mean i use customer service profit chain i use lots of you know time soft metrics to hard metrics and all of that stuff so there's lots of things we can do to demonstrate the value and the difference we're making but if you really put the sort of progressive side of hr under a microscope the stuff about investing in people coaching developing people creating a learning environment creating great teams you know you know, what we try and do is we do it through others. So it is about how do we empower people? How do we develop those skills? How do we create leaders and managers that are good at that? 
And so to some extent, the way I always see um, HR is like a an organisational coach. You know, you're not really running the race. The people management stuff's not really done by you. It's done by leaders and managers within your organisation. Your job is to coach, develop, give them the tools, get them to see what has an impact, show them the difference between good, average and poor. And the more that you think of yourself as a coach, I think, and mapping out plans and reviewing performance, and I think the better we are, the more I think that we see ourselves driving stuff, we tend to go back to transactional HR and worry about policies and procedures, and that doesn't add value. I think that one of the great things about HR is our major tool is we think is about creating processes and systems and and that's not what creates the value. It's how those things are utilized by managers and leaders that create the value. Yeah, I, I, I like the thinking. I, I probably <clears throat> there is also, I think, Kevin, a little sort of false modesty we have. Like, <laughs> so, so I like your point about seeing ourselves as coaches. If we would be able to redefine ourselves as co leaders of this business, but then we might get more focused on what we really want to deliver. Since intentionally, everything you mentioned, and all the issues we know of, they're not bad at all. It, it, you can see how the thinking is not bad, but there is something in our, and I'm generalizing a lot now, there is something in our professional attitude that as laudable as it may be in itself, it, it, it explains why we don't get the results because, because we, um, we we sort of fail or do not dare to take the prominence that is needed to to get those results. It's that, that, that's it's the, an I think it's an uh, it, I like this this Kevin your point on it's hard to say it's very often we don't fail and we don't succeed so it's yeah. it's in the middle and that is I think a strong indication for we really don't don't know what the goal is. We can describe the goal and anecdotally can prove prove progress, but but we can't measure. And that's uh, I think that's often often a problem. In my like my work in the HR space and, and in my consulting life was very much, I mean, the 37% would be very much on the positive side from what I have seen. I have been working with large organizations doing HR transformations. So that is all the, uh, yeah, as we all know, it's the, it's the heavy lifting of process and, and service design and uh, automation and harmonization and what have you, standardization. All these programs, from my perspective, and, and I, I've seen a few more modern and, and more advanced approaches to it, but the standard HR transformation was almost doomed to fail. Because it was um, it was pro probably some something like the aftermarket of, of McKinsey uh, that that left the CHRO with a twenty percent cost target, and that always came out of of um, a cons uh, of a benchmarking exercise. So each benchmarking exercise left a company with a twenty percent cost target, which is interesting in itself. And then and then uh, and then. HR had to do this, and th this was such a heavyweight thing. It took years, cost a lot of money, and frustration for everyone. And and that that part that I had visibility into, I think the failure rate was higher than thirty seven percent, way higher. <laughs> it was good for me. I was a consultant, so I earned a lot of, lot, lot of money with my company with it, but but not always good for the reputation for HR. And it made it much, much harder for after the fact of an HR transformation to come back and say, now I have a, I have a model in place how I can prove business impact or the line of sight to, perform, to company performance, as, as you put it, Hein. And therefore, I like, I like your way of doing that, Hein, of, of actually finding out the very few spots of value creation and concentrate on those. That is, I think, a very. I like it. It's 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 uh, mm. it's progress for the for the function. In general, I would say there is an uh, um, organizational dynamics. In general, do not drive, never drive focus, not never foster focus. There is this perennial temptation because people wish to matter, and that's a great thing. Uh, mm. There is this plethora of initiatives people uh, <clears throat> ready behind. 
And if as a CEO, you would wish to focus on a few priorities, you'd probably be faced with a company-wide conspiracy against. And it's so difficult. And I get the difficulty. I've been trying and failing very often over the past uh, years. But the point is, the point is we are inclined to take on a lot because we all are often very high on energy and not always very high on focus. And that's that will hold for other professions as well. That I don't think this is unique to HR. Mm-hmm. But I, I would I would think that an ability or a um, uh, a pressure to really focus on what matters would mm-hmm. increase greatly the probability of the impact of our of our efforts. I think I think I mean I challenge one of the statements there, which was this this thing about other functions, you know. And I think you're right, and we 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 are quite humble. And I think some of that is to do with measurability and metrics and proving impact. And I get that. But bit I suppose I think is interesting is, you know, marketing is, is about customers and, you know, customer value, the loyalty, the spend per square footage, whatever it is. Finance don't really worry about themselves because they're counting the money and budgeting and forecasting. <clears throat> sales are selling stuff and operations are running stuff and and then you have this sort of function which is about people well people are going across the piece and i think you i think the reason why i was keen to do this thing is this this webinar tonight is because you know i've spent a lot of time consulting and working with with hr functions and i have these three questions which i always ask senior hr team so just go through your people plan or your people strategy and and just ask yourself three questions why are you doing it what difference do you want it to make and how do you measure it? And I tell you what, within most people plans and most people strategies, 60, 70 percent of it just falls away because they've got no idea why they're doing it because they just think they should do it or they've benchmarked or McKinsey told them to do it or it's a good thing to do. They don't know what difference it's going to make and they can't measure it. And you can't you don't see that in many other functions and i like you know the analogy to marketing and customers you know we never used to measure brand and 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 and, uh, marketing spend and we didn't know what worked and what didn't work but now that you've got a profession where they do measure the return on the investment you get more money spent you get more credibility and it drives business that's i like that and i think that's i think that's our journey you know to to educate HR business people and leaders to be able to think about why are we doing it and the difference and articulate, you know, because I think that means we fail. We will end up trying to do activity where we don't get a return. You know, we've built That's a business case, we're clear, but it fails. and I don't think HR people like to fail. They like to be in the mediocrity. We like to just do nice things. That's if I can um, just, just come in on that, because, um, Certainly on from a recruitment perspective, when I'm talking to HR candidates and, and I'll say to them, I'll say, like, I did this and I'll, well, what's, the, what's the achievement? Why did you do it? What was the outcome from it? And I, when I'm sort of coaching them, particularly from an interview perspective, I'll say, you know, OK, you did this thing, but but why did you do it? And what was the outcome? And, and, and can you measure that? Can it be tangible? Because you can't argue with that if, it, if it's really measurable. I'm just going to sort of uh, we've got a, a few people that made some comments. People have said hi. So just uh, we've had Rosalind. So hi, Rosalind. Hi, Roger. Hi, Kareen. Hi, Serge. Hi, oh, yeah. Nessa. Oh, yeah. uh, got some friends. Uh, Natalia, um, Naomi. Uh, Nad, so we've we've got a few people, uh, oh, yes. Kareen as well. So, so yeah, we've got a few people coming in here, and certainly we'd like to know your thoughts, guys. So, so let us know if there's anything that you uh, want to ask, um, and certainly feel free to get involved in the discussion as well. I'm going to just play you a little clip actually, because it's very much linked to what you're saying a little bit, and it's it's actually from a previous show, and we did a show. Um, it sounds like it's a bit beaten down on HR, which is not the, the, the case at all, but it was at what HR does wrong. And it was supposed to be kind of like a, a look at what we could do to improve. And um, I'm just going to play a, a very short clip, um, which is Heiko Fisher, uh, and he's talking about his view on HR at the moment. So I'll just show that to, to everyone now. Have a clear introspection about what is it that we want to bring to the table? What value can we provi- provide and, and really truly evidence-based also show to be these translators from what Patrick and, and, and Helena were saying that we are the guys who understand people and science, but we also need to be the connectors to business value, right? And that's where I fundamentally see a skill gap um, in HR right now. Hmm. 
<laughs> I think that the reason I, I wanted to show so. you that was that, yeah, yeah he's. He, He's talking about this 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 skill gap, and it's a lot of the things I think what you're what you're talking about, and, and certainly sometimes what I see with with candidates as well when they get to the, when, want to get to the very top, you know, what is the the value that you that you bring to to the organisation? And, I... and this, so I, I like I like I like Heiko's point a lot, and I was going to say uh, to your point, Kevin, that I I think you you you're totally right there. Um, uh, Volker has been working on employee experience as a driver of um, of company productivity, and that has also identified that over the em total employee life cycle, there's only a limited number <clears throat> of moments that really matter. In the sense that if you make if you make an amazing impression as a as an employer on those particular moments, you can do with okay impressions on all the other moments. I'm making this a little too simple, Volker, but that's it. And that is so that leads the way to how can you efficiently drive the experience of the employee that drives productivity and then kevin yeah. and if i then look at for instance the mckinsey tool which is the, the organization health inventory that i worked with for a number of years where you get pretty pretty robust indicators of what you can work on in order to drive up the um, the engagement of people so I like your point, Kevin, and I would say there are some there. Uh, there is hope because we are making progress on some in some parts. Yeah, Do you agree. Uh, it's a it's it's a very good connector because because Heiko is absolutely right. So the, it's a skill gap, but it's 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 in principle a gap that we can't explain the the link to business value. And and Kevin, your point of we can learn a lot from. From the marketing side and there's strong comparison to the marketing side i couldn't agree more to that because in, in my employee experience work that we are doing it's like it's so like so obvious why wouldn't we learn from marketing marketing has done customer experience work for 15 years they have a, a whole industry that's a it's it's almost a 10 billion market that gives marketeers the means to prove impact on what they do on the customer experience and then it's the company's job to, to link customer experience improvement to revenue, I don't know, organic gro profitable growth or whatever the business, the business outcome is. So, and, and we spent three years, almost four, building that same data model out for the employee experience side. And an interesting, it was just copycat work, we thought, right? Steal with pride, do it, and here we are. The, the interesting thing is the employee experience world is so much more complex than the customer experience world. So like in the customer experience, the customer journey is in almost all cases linear. So you are aware of, of a need, you become aware of a need, and then you go through a linear journey to, to satisfying that need. Whereas the employee journey is very different. I mean, the candidate journey is a different story, Leon, but but... The, the employee journey, going to work every day, yeah. and the definition of, of experience being uh, the, 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 the difference between expectation and the actual experience of an interaction that you have at work. If that's the definition, you have hundreds of experiences every day. You do that 220 days a year. You do that, I don't know for how many years, but so the whole ecosystem of experiences at work is nonlinear and super complex. So, Hein, you, you said it, we found a way to limit it down to just a very few moments and touch points that matter for most people at work. Yeah. But that is a hell lot of, of, of it's, it's really a hell job to do it. And it's much more complex than the customer experience world. It's a, so the analogy is, is valid, but it's really, diff, it's really interesting yeah. to compare the two. Volker, just just on that point, because when we talk about, I, I still hear people when they when they talk about um, they talk about engagement a lot. Um, yeah. I I don't hear experience talked about a lot, and I don't necessarily know that everybody's definition of what employee experience is. What yeah. it encapsulate yeah, does yeah, it encapsulate yeah. well being? Does it include inclusive work? What actually? So, from your <laughs> perspective as an expert in this field, yeah. um, what is employee experience? Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. That is. <laughs> The, the number one question. <laughs> it's probably another yeah. show, isn't it? Sorry. Succinctly, Volker, because this isn't the show. 
<laughs> it's really, it's really like everyone has talked about employee experience and and I don't know, Qualtrix calls their, their products experience management. It's all experience, right? So if you look behind the scenes, it's 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 just engagement in new in new terms for most. If you really compare the two, engagement and experience, it's very different. Experience data is very, very different from engagement data. Engagement data, we all know what it is, right? So we have an engagement model we, and, and the results of engagement measurement we give to teams and team leaders. So we tell a team of, let's say, 15 people, you are 13% less engaged than the average of the company. And of an engagement model of, let's say, seven drivers of engagement, you're lacking behind in two drivers, and one is very likely leadership, and the second is empowerment. And now, <laughs> poor team leader, here are the, the seven standard things you should do, and please report back that you have done them. And that's that's so, and it's a good thing because it enables improvement of team dynamics, which is good. Experience is very different. Experience is you find out which interactions that people are having at work are breaking and you fix them as an organization. So the burden of action is not with the poor team leader and the team. It is for the organization to fix those things. And for that, it, it, so the dynamic is very different. But the big marketing messages out there make people confuse the two concepts and make them one and just call the older one the newer name that's <laughs> and that's a real problem uh, for, for the industry because and, and to, to the to the headline of the show improving employee experience is a good thing for hr to facilitate of course hr doesn't own many experiences just only the minority of them but facilitating a process of improving experiences is a very good value driver for HR as a function. I'm totally convinced about that and, and have, of course, examples of that. But that's a, that's a very good question, Leon. Thanks. Yeah, and for me, it, 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 the thing that's really inciting about employee experience isn't the process itself of getting the measurement, it's the learning. And again, I think this is the, this is the challenge for, for HR, which is they get obsessed with doing stuff and doing you know creating some measurement around employee experience the thing is is what drives it what are the experiences that are creating value what could you do that would have an impact on those how do you try it in one place and learn from it and then think about what you could do in another part of the organization what does it mean for style what do we need to do about it the great thing for me is it it gets people to look at data and to then try things. And when you start trying things with a measurement framework, you'll learn, you'll think, well, that works, that created some difference, that's created more, a better experience, and we're getting the productivity improvement or, we're, you know, and if you're getting that, then why wouldn't you do more of it? Why wouldn't you invest more in that activity to get greater productivity? So for me, that's the thing that the HR functions are starting to do, um, not as often and not as consistently as I think we'd all like. But that is the journey, you know, and it is similar to, to what marketing went through 15 years ago. As soon as you start to learn yeah. about the experience, you can yeah. then apply things and you can see the impact and then you can reflect, you can try, you can adapt, you can go again and then you can see what the, the the improvement in performance then is and i think that's the point you know i mean yeah, yeah. i got in i got into hr from a very much a sporting background which was you know just the whole coaching grow model stuff which is you know you 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 you, you review performance you look at what works you adapt you try again you change the training regime you then measurement again you and you just oh, keep going around that loop yeah. and but I, I think, think that's things, the key. Uh, that's the key shift for HR to for, I like forget that. about single play. You put a process in, you put performance management in, it's going to drive performance. It absolutely won't. But that I I I like the thinking. I've got this is an example which adds one thing. 
I, um, I've often talked to Robert Rigby Hall during his days that he was the chief HR officer at NXP, which was a spin-off of Philips in semiconductors, privately held, private equity held. And those guys, they were, they wished, wished to drive up the share price. It was very simple. And they were just <clears throat> bumping against that ceiling of 100 euro, and they needed to get to 150 or 160. And they had, and they had worked out that it was about engagement of employees. And just bear in mind, this is not this is not clerical staff. Those are all technicians and 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 and, and scientists, difficult to handle. And he he had a sort of five question, the Gallup, the twelve Gallup question. Yeah. Or, about that and then just ruthlessly compared good teams with bad teams and the manager of the good teams they were they were um, appointed coaches of the manager of the bad teams and they were just focusing on behaviors of those people and it, you might say in a depreciative way it's all about money what i liked about it is the money drive gave uh, led to very decent behavior and led to people feeling more recognized working better and then they sold the business at 170 euro per, per share and <laughs> I'm, I'm i totally understand life is a bit more complicated than that but what i liked here kevin and volker is that was an hr guy stopping to be coach and just taking responsibility i said sorry yeah. i'm a leader and he was in with, with this money yeah. i said fine <laughs> and that's so I like your learning thing, and I think you're totally right there. But it, what I also saw in that example was an HR guy and a, 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 a number of HR guys taking personal responsibility for the result. That's what I. So yeah, that yeah. doesn't take away anything of your learning thing that I like. But that sense of I am, I am a co-leader of this business. I am as responsible for the results as the others yeah. are. I like that. And I, yeah. and I think just to just to build on that, and I think one of the things if you you're doing that cycle, if you're looking at good performance and poor performance and learning from the poor perform, you know, the good performers and transferring it and doing different things. The thing that HR doesn't do is it doesn't stop very much. It doesn't yeah. stop activity. And if you start to go measure stuff and you start to see what works, the great power in this is like any other function will go, let's just get rid of some of this stuff. It doesn't make any difference at all. In fact, it most probably detracts. It gets in the way. You have managers filling in forms and doing ratings, and it makes no difference to performance. Whereas we have a huddle every day. We have a team conversation. We see that we get a different like change, change like in behavior. So for me... That's one of the things that you see in an HR function that really knows what it's about and focuses on impact. It can start going, start getting rid of some of this stuff because it doesn't add any value. Yeah, sure. It's interesting. We, so when we had the, the show on, on what HR um, gets wrong, performance management in particular was uh, – was very much something they were, they were all very critical of in terms of some of the, the practices and, and, and things, um, uh, and whether it was actually really adding much value or doing anybody any good um, for anything. We've, we've um, so I just wanna, um, if Alison Harper, just wanna say hi to you. Thanks for joining us. Um, Lucienne has agreed with you, um, Volker. Um, and then we've also had um, a question come through, which which goes back to the employee experience. We probably have to do a separate show actually on that, to be honest with you. So uh, we might get you back on at some point, maybe next year, Volker, and we'll get some other uh, experts in this particular area. But um, so is the employee's experience which influenced the engagement level or is the level of employee's engagement to influence the way he, I assume she, feels his work experience? Yeah. <laughs> Another one of those uh, very important questions. Um, so I think I think really um, it, it, it starts with so it's the organization's obligation to provide better experiences to people, and when people have better experience at work, and we differentiate them by some better experience means more easy, uh, more meaningful. And at, at times more desirable, that's that's better experience. So if, if you provide better experience to people at work, then they change their behaviors. And one of the behavior changes is they um, show more discretionary effort. And one of the behavior changes is they advocate more for the company and want to stay longer. And intent to stay and discretionary efforts are the two dimensions of engagement. So in that sense, Better experience drives engagement. 
That is correct. Yeah. Uh, and through that, we will find more significant and, in your words, more direct lines of sight <coughs> for performance and productivity. Uh, and we can prove that with, with data by now. So there is, that's the link. But it starts, the starting point is really provide a better experience to people at work, where it matters, of course. Otherwise, it's too expensive. It's spoiling the ocean. But, but yeah, that's, uh, that's it. I want to talk about um, talent a bit more because um, I, I watched a, a podcast with Dave Ulrich and he said, and I, I'm going to, it's going to paraphrase a little bit because it was a while ago. It's probably about nine months ago that I watched it. But he said, the most important thing HR function can do to add value to a business is hire the right people. Now, obviously, as a recruiter myself, that was like, oh, well, if he's saying that, that's, uh, you know, that, that proves my kind of point about making sure you get the right people through the door. But obviously, from a talent perspective, and obviously, uh, you know, Hein and, and Kevin in particular, um, the, the, the talent piece is, I suppose, probably where you would say that you most focus. I know, obviously, there's a lot of agile HR stuff that, that Hein, you've done in the past with, with ING and things like that. But in terms of the talent piece, where, where how do you show the company value in terms of you know hiring talent in terms of getting you know developing that talent and i think you, you talk about mobilizing talent as well don't you hine uh, with the ceo works so i wonder if you could um, let us know from from a talent perspective what your um, how yeah. that would drive company performance so leon contemplating reflecting on um, on uh, on my career uh, it uh, I'm not being nasty about Dave Ulrich that I think who I think has added a lot to impact of HR. Mm -hmm. uh, hiring the right people is well said, but but what what we tend to overlook when talking about talent, traditionally all our talent management um, efforts, often very good, often very sophisticated. They um, it strikes me now they were often solely focused on the supply side of talent, the people, thinking about the people, thinking about potential, and all of that. And what I, in hindsight, think, uh, and what explains why I went wrong in selecting people, is the demand side of talent management is is overlooked and is not being spent attention to. And what I mean by that is, in this role that I'm going to attract the talent for what exactly needs to be delivered in the next three years and not 25 things because that's too much three to five things that need to be delivered and where possible with numbers and timing and what I've seen is every time uh, when I achieve to get that very very clear I was also very clear about the risks around the role risks that did not necessarily have to do anything with the person in the role and in that sense, my lenses by which I looked at talent were much clearer. And also my understanding of what I needed to do to set up that person for success. So the, the, my summary is as, as well as we have done on the supply side and often very well, uh, we have overlooked the demand side and that's where the greatest potential for, um, uh, for greater impact sit, uh, sits, wow. I think. Uh, I mean, I, I think... I I think one of the questions I have with most organisations when we talk about talent is what's their definition of talent, yeah. and, and I and I find it woolly at best in lots of organisations. It yeah. really means some potential people that have succeeded in previous jobs, yeah. or we want to hire some people that have got a bit of a track record. And and I think one of the things we have to get better at is we have to get more granular when we're talking about talent. Yeah. You know. Um, and articulate it a bit better. Um, so I think there's something that I, I've seen in organisations that do this well, that, that spend a lot of time actually thinking about it. I mean, there's this great little story that someone told me once about, if you ask a chief exec, he's got 300 people on the, the, a plane, his whole leadership population, and the plane goes down and they all get, they all, they're all killed and somehow the chief exec survives. Who are the 10 people you'd bring back and why? And I tell you what, quite often the 10 people that are brought back aren't the people on the talent pipeline, aren't in the succession plan. Because what we tend to overlook is we see talent through a sort of a halo effect. It's about people that are great leaders or quite similar to the leaders we've had before. And, it, and I think it, 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 it diminishes neurodiversity. I think we've got to look differently at talent. And so that's one Thing I, I thought would be interested to say about talent because yeah. I think yeah. that's a bit controversial. And the second thing is, 
I think we're obsessed about talent from an individual perspective. And the bit that I'm really interested in, and, and, and I think most organisations are really waking up to this, is about teams. People do most of their work in teams, um, whether that's a project team, whether it's a functional team, whether it's an operate, doesn't matter. But they work in teams and sometimes they work in multiple teams. And I think HR spends too much time working at organisational level and at individual level. And if you go in, so what are you giving to your leaders and managers about how to develop um, a great team dynamics, the ability for people to collaborate and create value and be supportive? And there's not a lot there. So I think one of the things we need to do is stop thinking about everything around individuals and more about how do we actually get better at putting groups of people together? so that they they create high performing teams because we know high performing teams are the key to to, to radical uh, performance improvement so i think there's a couple of thoughts there one is just be clear about what you mean by talent and why it fits with your strategy and how they're going to create value and secondly don't just think about individuals but think about how you bring groups of people together because talented teams is what we're really after i'm not interested in having a high performing guy or a woman who's brilliant but actually can't work with others, can't collaborate, can't create value. You know, the whole, anyhow, a couple of thoughts about talent, which most probably seem to seem to get a reaction. Yeah. Mm. So um, we've had a, a question come in from Roger. Um, so he's asked, um, there's a few questions actually in here. The, the one that I was particularly interested in was, uh, how long do you give it to measure if change is working? But he starts off, so how do you avoid being seen as continually shifting the posts by employees when you take on continuous improvement approach? And how long do you give it to measure if change is working? And does it depend on the particular industry? Uh, we are obviously a little bit pushed for time. So I wonder if one person and would be uh, kind enough to, to give us their, their views and thoughts on that one um, from, from Roger's question. Yeah, I, I would say <clears throat> uh, I think typically, and I'm now making this a little too simple just to convey the thinking, Roger, I think typically we give it far too much time to measure if change is working. We're endlessly patient with people, and that in itself I find a beauty. But if you want to drive company results in a certain time, I would say we have to become much clearer about what we wish to work on. If, if, I, if I work on Volker's weaknesses for the next year to come, they will have improved a little bit, will never have turned into strengths. What would have happened if I had worked on Volker's strengths during that year? So that there is this, this, this trade-off you have to make where, where I would say I think we do well to give more clarity sooner to people and allow them the opportunity to find a different way. The point about the continually shift in the post, I'm not so sure, Roger. I think uh, life and business and competition shift the post continuously. So I'm not sure we're ever going to escape continually shifting the post. I, I'm, I'm afraid that's a bit part of business life nowadays. It's yeah. just part of this. I, I, so I'd support that line. I think I think continuous learning. It's it sort of in the in the title. It's continuous, isn't it? You know, it goes on forever. And if you think about, you know, I'm a great believer in agile working. You know, you try something, you learn from it, you reflect, you look at the data, you go again. That gets you somewhere. You go again. That's how we have to run organisations. Yeah, and I, I support that with my with my heavy top down HR transformation projects. They were defined as projects, so by definition, having an end which is just wrong because uh, it, 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 and it, so many of them have failed. And, and so this, this new agile approach of, of continuous learning and, and failing fast and, and trying things out and is, is the learning organization, is the continuous improvement, gives you the ability to measure success. So all in for that, Kevin. Okay. So um, this was a question actually I put to Heim when we first had a, a, a chat and we discussed about the, the idea of this show. I don't know if you remember me saying it, Heim, but I said, the reality is that there are, that like most businesses are, are smaller businesses. They don't have huge budgets. There's a lot of people that probably watch this, the HR directors, HR leaders. They might have small teams. They might have, you know, 200 people, less, may, maybe up to a thousand or something like that. That's what most companies are. And most HR practitioners are working within that space without huge budgets, without centers of excellence, without, you know, necessarily the, the, the chance to use the best tech and things. So I suppose that the sort of question um, that, that springs to mind is, what advice would you give to a HR director 
who has a small budget, perhaps in a smaller company, that they can really focus on because they've still got to do some of the legal stuff. They've still got to work within those frameworks and things. What 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 is what is the best thing that they could probably do to drive business performance? Uh, it, <clears throat> it it starts, I think, with with a good a decent understanding of how this particular business makes their money and where the growth sits and from there to draw working with the with the general manager or the ceo on so what really really matters and there's a lot in every company uh going on where you would say don't touch it let it it's not perfect but it doesn't harm it is good is good enough and f forget about the complicated process and really focus on the two or three things that you and your ceo agree really makes a difference this is very hard it's not intellectually hard but it's hard because people have this inclination to take on far too much but but my 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 most passionate advice to the sort of hr professional you are referring to leon and there are many of those i said the greatest impact you will have is by being very close to the ceo on what really matters and from what really matters it also follows what matters less and this is not, I mean, it is not easy, but it's, that will be my advice. Focus on what really, really matters in the view of the leadership of the business and work on those things. Anyone want to add to that? Or, or well, I'll, I'll, to just, just, this is more from, I, I totally agree. You know, focus on the business strategy, what creates value for customers, focus on what that is and how do the people impact on that. So I, I totally agree with that. Just a rule of thumb, two things I always say to HR people really is think about your recruitment process. So how do you bring people into the organization? Make sure that you are testing people. Interviews don't work. We know they don't work. One-on-one -on -one interviews. We've known for 40 years how are most people hired still one-to-one -one interviews. Why the hell are we still doing that, right? <laughs> Why don't we do the two things that we know work? Test people and get multiple eyes on candidates, right? You'll end up improving your hiring by about 30 or 40%. Secondly, we know the other thing that has a huge impact on experience is the capability of frontline managers. So really spend a lot of time thinking yeah, about those people that manage the majority yeah, of your nice. people. Are they open? Have they got the skills? Yeah. Can they give feedback? Can they, you know, yes. use basic metrics to manage performance? You get them two things right in most organisations, you're sort of on the way, aren't you? You know, I'm not saying it's the answer in itself, oh, but focus yes. on the value. Get them Thank two you. bits right, and you, you're on you're yeah. on the right journey. You know, you're on the oh, right. Kevin, very good, Kevin. I I I, I have to add to the, to your second point on the frontline manager. We've we've done a lot of work on them. Uh, so a couple of data points: frontline managers. So working with like managers of teams that deal with customers, that is, uh, that's an interesting group because customers are having a customer experience as we know, and the, the teams that are working with them can impact that a lot. So, the, and, and that's one thing that we know without, from our data. The second thing we know is the one touch point in, through which these people, the, the, the frontline teams, are having their work experiences, that is the by far most impactful is their direct manager. So it's the frontline manager who has the by far highest impact on the experience of frontline teams. And these teams have impact on the customer experience. And now here's the thing. We haven't thought enough about what makes the life of frontline managers mm -hmm. easier because That's your point. That's your point. if frontline yeah. managers have a good experience, that will lead to a better frontline team experience, which will lead to a better customer experience. And here is one of those, Heine, I like that, one of those linchpins where we, by focusing on a small, a relatively small group of people, HR can have direct line of sight to business performance and yeah, that that's, is, point. that's that's what's uniting all three of our views it's a very good thing. I, I think you're totally and Kevin your point makes a lot of sense to me as well I would say the 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 um, at least the biggest leverage you have as an HR professional is the capability of the manager I totally totally agree and oh no this is a very good point so I like your I like your succinct advice Kevin to, uh, <laughs> to HR yeah I think you're totally right 
Yeah, totally right. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for that. I think that's. Um... I just know that there'll be a lot of people that will listen to this or watch this. If they're not watching live, they may be watching in the future. And a lot of them will be thinking, well, you know, you guys have all worked with big multinational businesses. I've got like a tiny team, you know, I've got like three in my team. And how do I, you know, what do I do first with all of that? Because I can't look at each different thing in component. It's, you've almost got the whole thing to look at. And I know it can be more challenging in, you know, for those guys to, to really make sure they had that impact. So before we, we, we're sort of going to wrap up a little bit on that bit, but um, obviously you three are, have got great experience within the HR and um, uh, obviously, um, you know, come with very good reputations and things. So I'm just very intrigued actually to think about the future and what you see as the future for the HR profession, because it always fascinates me when I talk to people about what they, what they think that would be. So I'd like to get an answer from, from the three of you actually individually about um, how do you see the future of HR as a profession? So um, yeah, who wants to go first? I'll go first. I'll tell you okay. why, because 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 I think I think I, I think we'll have a pretty common view here. I, I think the future belongs to HR. I think the part about business performance that's underdeveloped, the muscle we haven't really grown and developed, is the whole stuff around people, and it's about the people experience that you've heard about. So actually, businesses are going to focus on this stuff because this is the big area where they can get radical improvement in in business results. So I think that's the good side of the story. The difficult side of the story is whether we're up for it. And if we're not up for it as a profession, as we're currently constituted, other people will do this work. And that might be the consultants. It might be other professions. But the point is the opportunity is huge, but we've got to grasp it. Because if we carry on doing what we've always done, we're not going to be in the space where we add the value, we'll get the respect, we'll be listened to, and we'll drive performance. The organisations that get that right and get the right HR people will leverage value like you wouldn't believe. So I think it's a huge opportunity, but we sort of got to sort ourselves out. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I I have a little to add. A little to add. I think you're. I, I might add that it comes with with much stricter distinguishing what we really add value with and what sits in what profession yeah. uh, whether much stuff that you can do without you can't do without but you can leave it to other companies and there's this stuff that kevin refers to that you should always keep in your company and then i can totally see the enormous leverage hr can have on the performance of the company yeah, yeah. probably probably comes with slightly different mix of people but it's the uh, yeah i i get that i i totally agree with them yeah I have a slightly less positive view. <laughs> um, I totally agree. The future is the people. Uh, I'm not so sure if the future is HR. Um, so, so people and managing people is very important and will be more important. We have like all the, like COVID has shown it, our DEI discussions, hybrid work great resignation, all that. Yet it's becoming so much more important, so much more fast <laughs> that the C-suite may lose their patience yeah. okay. uh, with, with HR as a function. And I think that it's a bit of a 30-70 split. 30% of, of HR functions will be able to provide or provide clear line of sight to business performance or have a clear link of the few things that really drive productivity and they will have a golden future, whereas it will be harder to justify for the other 70% what they're doing. It's, it's, I think it's, it's going to be a tough ride for the function, whereas the topic, of course, is, is much more um on the yeah, to the fore and and and, and um striving yeah yeah it's always good to get world. it's a bit of a yeah. sad i know yeah thanks it's for that no yeah. it's, it's it's always good to get other ideas i mean this you know this is this is the the point i mean you know uh what you're saying volker we, we've had people uh on the shows in the past that have had views that are very different to others i mean a hiker obviously played earlier he, he very much is i think he's known in germany as the hr killer isn't he so um mm. you know there, there's definitely some some interesting uh views and things and that's what we we want to do on, on hosting hr so um we 
we just want to, we're very much at our hour now. So um, we're going to go back and we're going to do our two lies and one truth reveal. <laughs> um, so um, I try to remember who started now. I can't remember who started. I think we started with you, didn't we, Hein? So remind us of your three and then we'll we'll try and guess which is the one that's the truth. Yeah, so the three were, I'm a runner at 45 kilometers a week. I read one book a week and, I, and I'm a certified choir master. And so um, the truth is... Well, no, no, don't tell yeah. us yet. We're, we're going to guess. We're going to guess. Oh, sorry. Okay. I think they definitely I, all could be true. That's, that's, that's a difficult one. Go on, Kevin. <laughs> I, I, I was, I was, I was, I thought about the choir master because, but Hein gave us quite a lot of detail. So I'm going to go for the yeah. runner. I'm gonna go for that <laughs> I think the detail was a complete red herring. He was trying to take us down that little path. Go on, Volker. You said you think you know which, what, what it was, didn't you? You said you were pretty confident. Yeah, I, I, I was going for the choir master. Uh, okay. I like the story. It was just too good a story to not be true. Yeah. So, I, th I mean, the one book a week, that wouldn't surprise me at all. Like, even yeah. though I know you've got loads going on, I, I could yeah, totally, yeah. I mean, you're, yeah. you know, you're very interested in the inquisitive yeah, yeah. person. Okay, that wouldn't surprise me. Line. But I think the truth is probably the quietest because I think there was just so much detail in there. It seems so personal to you that I just thought that's got to be it. He's just told you've us way too much information. Go on then. Yeah. Go on then, Hein. <laughs> Tell us which is the truth. I was a choir master, yeah. Ah. <laughs> 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 it just uh, seems so uh, personal. I was like, this is uh, a brilliant uh, lying right. or it's bang on true. Yeah. <laughs> totally, totally <right>. yeah. <laughs> Excellent. So I think Volker and I got that right and, and Kevin uh, not quite so on that one. So um, uh, Volker, you went next, didn't you, with your three? three yeah, yeah. The, were. the acting Hamburg champion in traditional archery. Um, my wife uh, drawn from a lottery <laughs> and uh, 50 meters deep diving, free diving. Go on. Let, let me go first. I've got to have a guess on this one. It, it, the truth has got to be draw your wife from the lottery because you'd be, <laughs> you'd be mad to say that if it wasn't true. <laughs> In public. <laughs> is your is wife it... watching at all, Volker? Is she supporting you? <laughs> no. Better things to do than watch. I, I, just think, I, just think, I just think you'd have to be so brave to say that if it wasn't true. <laughs> <laughs> Hein, what, what, what do you think it is? I think it was such an incredible story about his wife. That must be the truth. <laughs> really? Right. So I, 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 I wish it's the free diving thing. I just think that would be yeah. really, a, if that is definitely it, then I just salute you straight away because that's brilliant. Yeah. But I think it's, I reckon it's probably the, so it's the Hamburg archery champion or something. Yeah. I think so, it's that uh, one. Yeah. I wish it was the free diving. Yeah. That but, would be cool. uh, not at all. <laughs> uh, <laughs> traditional archery, traditional archery is what I do. So I thought Hein would take that because I may have mentioned it earlier. But but uh, I'm actually not the acting Hamburg champion in it. I'm I'm the third um, of, of, from the last championship, and that is because um, I shot three arrows on my neighbors target um so that is the the most embarrassing sports story that ever happened to me because there were like 450 people laughing uh, at me three more now yeah. 453 so, now yeah so so that that brings uh my wife in the lottery that's the truth uh it was at, it was a party game so everyone had to draw draw a name um and in, in my case a, a, the male part of a famous couple and my job at the party was to find like mm -hmm. my counterpart and that happened uh, to become my wife so that's uh that's the story wow, Beautiful wow. Story. that's a lovely Beautiful lovely story. story yeah that, that's story. Yes. that's that's lovely so um i got that one wrong so um and you guys got it right so i think we've all got one right and one wrong i think so far right so kevin it's yours hey. My three stories was uh, I'm married uh, to the same wife for uh, 30 years and I have seven children. The second one was that I played the lead role uh, when I was younger in The King and I, the musical The King and I. And the first one was I beat uh, world champion Chris Akabusi at 800 metres. Mm hmm <laughs> Who's going first, Volker? Hi, what do you think? I, I said, well, I, I go for the seven children, that's the truth. Seven children, Volker. 
Yeah, I don't think the seven children, nor do I think that you've beaten the the 800 meters. So I, I'll go for the king and I. Um, that I think that's the right one. I also think I, I could see you in Amdram. I think you'd be yeah, very, yeah, yeah, very yeah, good. Yeah, exactly. I think you I think you've got you've got a bit of presence about you, Kevin. I could totally well, see that. So I'm going with that one. I think I've won the prize then because the the the, the truth is I beat Chris Akabusi at 800 meters. Uh, <laughs> come on. <laughs> Tricked us all. <laughs> well I, I am married. I've only, I am married. Got one son. I was, in, uh, I was in the King and I, but I played. I was a child, and my mother was into amateur dramatics, so I got roped in. But I did beat Chris Akabusi over eight hundred meters. I think he must have had an wow. off day, but it yeah. was a long time ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow, Graceful. that's really, really Graceful. impressive. Well, um, so this is the last show of twenty twenty one. So um, I just want to say a huge thank you, obviously, to you three for joining us on the panel for this show, um, and thank you to everyone that's been involved with hosting HR this year. Uh, we will definitely be back. Uh, I'm going to do a bit of like a highlights sort of thing planned for December, lots of short clips and things like that. Um, but we won't be doing a full live show in December with Christmas and everything. Uh, we will be back in January, and we're going to be discussing men pause at work um, so please do um, tune in in the middle of January for that show um, but otherwise yep yeah, thank you you three thank you for watching at home and if you're not watching the live um, thank you for watching and uh, or listening on the podcast um, with us as well thank you